heaven and earth will disappear, but my words remain forever. But no one knows the date now when the end will be, not even the angels. No, nor even God's Son. Only the Father knows. The world will be at ease, banquets and parties and weddings, just as it was in Noah's time before the sudden coming of the flood. People wouldn't believe what was going to happen until the flood actually arrived and took them all away. So shall my coming be. Two men will be working together in the fields, and one will be taken, the other left. Two women will be going about their household tasks, one will be taken, the other left. So be prepared, for you don't know what day your Lord is coming. Life was filled with guns and war, and everyone got trampled on the floor. I wish we'd all been ready. Children died, the days grew cold. A piece of bread could buy a bag of gold. I wish we'd all been ready. There's no time to change your mind, the sun has come, you've been left behind. A man and wife are sleeping there. So the first man, Adam, must die. That's the new man, the eternal man, come alive in Christ Jesus. Something that's occurred to me this morning is in the body of Christ, we're all of all nations. We come from all nations, whatever a biblical nation might be. But there's neither Jew nor Gentile, male or female, bond or free in the body of Christ. We're all one in Christ Jesus, that one unified body. But we come from all nations. The last man who's been made a quickening spirit, the first man die, that the new man come alive. Now, I've been thinking because the old man, so Babylon is unification for me. Lucifer is unification of mankind in direct rebellion against God. So it's all nations, right? All nations come together under Lucifer that first man and they all nations and they make up the body of lucifer which is the body of the harlot we in the body of christ the lord jesus christ are the body of christ who make up that body of christ which is jerusalem and where that last man come alive who are also all nations as i go on and on 
the first man is the complete opposite to the last man. Lucifer is the complete opposite to the Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel is the opposite to the law. I see Lucifer as old and I see Jesus as new and eternal. Adam and the Lord Jesus Christ, both the Son of God. I just see it on so many different levels, old, new, and that's what the testimony of Jacob, the seed of Jacob, is all about. From the old to the new, from the darkness to the light, the opposites. Lucifer to Jesus. I'm just seeing it all over. Now, as I set out on this, my latest sojourn in the scriptures, what is it? It is the 11th today. It's the 11th of February, and it's around about midday, 10.30, here on the New South Wales Central Coast. And I am currently up to, it was Nehemiah, it was Nehemiah 3, I think. It's around about there, Nehemiah 3. No, 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 it's not Nehemiah 3. It would be, I should have got this ready, right? It must be 4, because Nehemiah 3.15... This time, I had a look at that word stairs. I had a look at it again, and it pertains to thoughts. So the stairs that went down, that come down from the city of David. So what's the city of David? Is it Zion or Jerusalem? But it's pertaining to thoughts. The, 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 the stairs of David. David, the seed of eternal glory. The seed of the morning stars. The seed of the total outcome, the progression of faith. The transfiguration into glory the star children, the sons of God, the morning stars, the thoughts, right? The thoughts, they're the stairs of David that come down from the city of David, which is either Bethlehem or, or Zion. I'm not sure. I'm not sure of which one. But, 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 but today I need to, I've got so much coming in. I need to stay on track. What I've decided to do today is at the end of the last video, I still had quite a few more Bible verses of the day to go. And I thought, right, over the last couple of days, I thought, right, I'm going to do a standalone video that's centering around those Bible verses of the day. But what I've been finding as well is that some new things are coming in that pertains to these Bible verses of the day. Just how I'm starting to get a bigger understanding now of what this gospel is and what our purpose is. So what's our purpose? If I, what I ask today, what thinketh ye? What is the purpose of the body of Christ? For me, to put it simply, it's to bring forth fruit. What does that actually mean? What I want to do today is a video centering around that, and I'm also going to just talk about false doctrine, and I'm going to talk about deception, and I want to make it absolutely clear that I'm not judging anybody, but what I am judging is false doctrines, and I'm most certainly judging lies. And a big, a big lie that I'm seeing on the earth right now is trying to establish your righteousness, your own righteousness, through what you see as the iniquities of others, and establishing your righteousness simply because you're awake and thinking it's just about waking other people up before you've even started in the progression of faith yourself because you just think all you have to do is hit your knees and say the name of the Lord Jesus Christ because you're afraid of the evil, right? Those of us in the body of Christ who fear God are not afraid of the evil. Are you afraid of the evil? I can, with an honest heart right now, say that I am not. I ain't afraid of the evil because right now my faith is soaring and that always leaves me quite worried <laughs> when my faith is soaring because generally it, it ends up being a... It ends, up, it ends up being a chastening, which always exercise the peaceful fruits thereof on the other side. But at the time, it's it's never, it's, 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 it's quite grievous. It's never pleasant. And I felt good now for a few days. I felt real good for about a week now. I haven't had a chastening for about a week and I'm feeling, I'm feeling real good. So I'm fearing a chastening's on its way. And it's led me to ask, is it all right? Is it all right to be thinking that your faith is soaring? And to, be, and to become confident in your faith, for me, that's the outcome. There's a Bible verse of the day I got, actually, that I forgot to get ready, of course, because I've just got so much coming at the moment, and I'll put it up on screen now. But Paul, when he's addressing one of the one of his epistles, he says that, that it's, it, it's glorious that your faith is growing exceedingly, right? For me, it's got to be about 
Well, not for me. It's for me. It, well, it's the. It, it is what's happening. Our faith increasing is terrific, but it's got to be faith that's based around testimony, and not faith that's based on the works of our own hands. So, so, so thinking we've been called, for instance, unless you can actually quantify it by testimony, thinking that we've been called to run around and wake, try and wake other people up. That's our. That's our purpose in life. Is just to wake other people up to the evil of the world, right? For me, that's going about that, that. That's that's going about establishing your own righteousness due to what you see is other people's iniquities, other people's shortcomings, and thinking that salvation is just being awake to what's going on in the world. And all you have to do is hit your knees and just run around trying to wake people up, and that's it. You've done your job, right? For me, no. There's two things going on. There's the world, and there's the heavenly kingdom, and we serve one or the other. There's no gray area. We serve one or another. So for me, you've repented and you've received the seed. You've received your part of the Holy Spirit, your field in the farm. You've received the resurrection. So now those things are old. They're past. We absolutely keep an eye on the world because we have to live here as carnal entities, but those things are past. What we're doing now is serving this kingdom and a centerpiece of that is to be led by the Spirit of God not by the works of our own hands, gathering testimony. It's all about testimony. Just a couple of things I've got noted down here. I have got them written out because I've got so much coming in at the moment. I want to make sure I get all this. I want to make sure I get all this right. So that that, that would be when I, it be, it's apparent that I'm reading it. That's, that's why, right? So I see that our faith, it has to be in a hostile environment. Where we are has to be here. Faith has to come here. So for me, this is why the man was created. The man was created so that we can defeat sin by faith in our carnal bodies of flesh. But the man was also created to be an adversary to God. The first man had to be an adversary that was dead in sin. The first man for me is the enemy of the cross. So if we were just in the Garden of Eden, it's not faith, right? So for me, a, a, an absolutely critical part of the progression of faith is not having an understanding of God's perfect, a perfect knowledge of God and an understanding of his perfect will. Because if I had a perfect understanding of God and his perfect will, well, then I would just know what to do all the time. You just got a situation, you know what God wants, so you just go and do it because that it's easy, right? Because we know God's will. A big part of the progression of faith is continuing to gather in faith by testimony. So then we get enough testimony and our faith increases that much that we, we just we, we start to understand more the knowledge of God and a knowledge of his perfect will. It's a part. It's a part of the gift. And for me, perfect faith is perfect understanding of God and perfect understanding of his perfect will. There are two, once those things join, for me, that's when the seventh angel sounds and all of this and, and all of this is done. We have to be in a hostile environment where we're the odd ones out and nobody wants to nobody wants to listen to us. Now, what I'm seeing on the earth right now is that all of these evil agendas that they're pouring out, they're for many, many different reasons why they're doing this, but for us in the body of Christ. I see these. The, the, so we got the we got the Bible verse of the day, right? So I'll I'll, I'll go to it. I, I knew this had happened. I sort of <laughs> I've got so much loaded up here, but I'll go to this Bible verse of the day that I I was going to share this one this one here in first first Peter five eight. Be sober, be vi vigilant, because your adversary, right? The adversary, the adversary, the the provoker, the devil. As a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Right now, I my understanding of that till quite recently was it's just about walking against the course of the world and not giving in to their tyranny, not giving into it. Right. So a big one for me was during the Purple Dragon. It was my testimony. I could not participate in any of that, and I didn't. And I feel now that I've just become, my faith has increased so much more as a result of that. And now I, my faith has grown exceedingly, right? This is something else I want to talk about in just a sec too. My faith has just grown 
monumentally as a result of that. My, that was my understanding of that scripture. But what I'm starting to see now is that all of these agendas on the earth, because I know back in those days, I remember the, the, the experience with the dentist. I, I, I revile at how I behaved with that dentist now because I was belligerent and I was argumentative, right? I see a lot of this evil that we see on the world in the world. It's to tempt us to walk outside the gospel, just as the Pharisees, the scribes, the chief priests did to the Lord Jesus Christ all the way through. Now, the gospel isn't hitting your knees and saying, please, Lord, save us from the evil. No, no. The gospel is the gospel of peace, love and truth, bringing forth the fruits of the spirit by faith, defeating sin, unbelief, deception in our carnal bodies by faith. And a big part of faith for me now is walking in the gospel no matter, no matter what the adversity is. I'm seeing that fighting evil in the world by faith, that's just an added benefit. So when the purple dragon comes back, I now am going to go out and not wear a face mask and I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to participate in any of it, right? That's an added benefit to all this, but I'm going to do it rooted in the gospel at all times. That's our purpose, to remain rooted in the gospel, bringing forth, fighting evil with common sense and love in a fear of God and not a fear of the man, fear of man. So what's what's fear of God? He's watching. He we, we we've got he's 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 our he's our God. He's our Father. It's reverence. It's every thought. I want to talk about every thought into captivity today too. It's every thought into captivity to God. We fear Him. We don't fear these monsters running the world. They are just trying to tempt us. Testimony is faith. And we receive testimony by faith. This whole thing is about faith. And it's not it's not just faith that Jesus is going to save us from the wrath to come. It's faith in the gospel and faith that the Holy Spirit will not only allow us to walk in the gospel in this hostile environment, it's the very command that we do so. Now, every adversity is an opportunity to receive more testimony. So this is so I'm no one great, right? I'm just reflecting on my testimony. That's what this page was set up as, and I'm I'm good to it to this day. That's what this page is. It's a diary of my walk on the earth since I woke up, started to wake up in September 2016 when I learned that that moon landing was a hoax. I'm no one great, but I'm sharing that testimony. A guy who's been very very blessed indeed who just continues to back the gospel and continues to back my faith, continues to back the Lord Jesus Christ and the Father. Now, as a result of all that, it was hard. It was hard walking into shops, walking into shops when they've got the Tower of Nonsense there and they've got someone on the door. They've got security on the door and you have to follow all of these guidelines and not once, not once did I succumb. Now, as a result of that, my faith increased exceedingly. At any point, I could have went, oh, I just want to go, I just want to get along. I just want to go, I'm going to go along to get to get along. I'll just put a mask on here because it's just, it's just a little bit awkward here and it's just a little bit too hard. No, not once. And that purple dragon, I feel like I'm the most blessed man in the world due to that thing. It was just, I see all of these agendas that are, part, that are, that are poured out on the earth they just bless me every single last time because I hit it with faith. Faith is, is testimony and we receive testimony by faith. It's this cycle of life that I talk about. Testimony is the word of God. Every adversity is an opportunity to receive more testimony. You receive more testimony, you receive more faith because testimony is the word of God. Now, I'm also seeing as well that we do not use our testimony and knowledge to puff ourselves up and to destroy. We give it to edify, to encourage, to build each other up as the builders of the house of God, the, 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 the body of Christ, Jerusalem, the Lord Jesus Christ, the head and the master builder. Now, I liken it to our testimony is it's a shed of tools in the garage so we have a conversation and we need this tool to have this conversation with this person we don't just blah blab out everything because we're so great and we're running around trying to wake other people up by the works of our own hands no we use our testimony 
our tool, our shed of tools in the backyard, we use it to edify and we, we always, always, always season our conversation with salt in a fear of God. Every single last time, not a fear of man, not trying to establish our own righteousness and not trying to puff ourselves up in the imagination of our own evil heart, trying to uphold our own righteousness, right? Our own glory. It's for all for the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is something I also want to put down today because I'm seeing now as I grow and grow and grow in this, I'm starting to see things now with a whole heap of a new clarity. And I feel absolutely compelled to do this video today simply because of that fact. So I'm going to start here with this, this Bible verse of the day in, in 2 Corinthians. This one has, I have looked at this in the past and I've looked at it and I've looked at it and I marveled at it, but I've never had really much understanding of it. But I, it comes through on Thursday and I looked at it and I thought, my, 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 I reckon I might just understand this. 2 Corinthians 5.21 for he has made him to be sin for us. So the Lord Jesus Christ became sin. He was sin itself, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So the Lord Jesus Christ became sin. He appeased God's wrath by being sin. He became the very embodiment of sin. Every sin that had happened in the history of the creation the Lord God, the Father, he put it squarely on the back of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ took it all. So as a result of that, sin is now taken out of the way for us, right? So who's us? Who's us? Only those that repent, who knew no sin, that we might, we might, right? That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. After this semicolon here, this scripture is absolutely loaded. So the whole scripture is loaded. And I now, I just, I, I think I understand it. Well, I'm confident there. The, it, I, only, well, I only say I think I understand it because unless it goes even deeper than my current understanding. But right now I have an understanding in this scripture and I'm going to, the, the whole video is going to really focus around this. And by the end of it, I'm going to come back and say, that's the plan anyway. So this is why this is now making sense to me, right? So the Lord Jesus Christ became sin for us. So he became the, he became sin itself. So now he became the center, the victim of God's wrath for sin. He took it on, the expeciary sacrifice, and he knew no sin. So he was the perfect, sinless sacrifice wherein there was no blemish. Now, the reason why he did that is that so we can be made the righteousness of God in him. So it's all about the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is just center of all that. Now, I also wanted to share this one last video of all this. I also wanted to share this one last video. So 2 Samuel 22, 31 in the big color, it came last Monday. As for God, his way is perfect. So that would be a Hebrew word, H1870, I'm being led to think. It's a coarse manner, a way of life, a thought. A, just our, 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 our every thought is the, the way of the Lord, the, the progression of faith, because his way is perfect. The more we understand God and come into a more refined understanding of God and his perfect perfect understanding of him and, and, and the perfect knowledge of his perfect will, the, the closer we are to being in the image of God, thus perfect, that one with one another, one with the Lord Jesus Christ is already one with the Father. As for God, his way is perfect, the word of the Lord, right? So this is the seed, this is the water, this is the Lord Jesus Christ. The word of the Lord, and this is testimony, the word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all of them that trust in him, right? Not hitting your knees, begging the Lord to save us from the wrath to come because we're afraid of that. No, no, we trust in him that he's going to allow us to continue to serve him by walking in this gospel in the furnace of filth, the fry pan of faith, 
in planet Babylon, in this hotbed of filth that is planet Babylon, as we walk against the course of this world in the most hostile environment, it cannot be done without God. It cannot be done without faith in God. It's not about saving our own skin. It's about, it's about this right here that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. This is the whole idea. This is the mission of the body of Christ that you and I, us, are made the righteousness of God in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ. He is everything. The crucifixion and the and the resurrection and the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ is everything because God made him the perfect sinless sacrifice to be sin for us so that we will be made the righteousness of God in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thus, we trust in him. We believe in the resurrection. We believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Our mission, our mission is so the righteousness of God can be revealed in us through the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Lord, we, we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now, Romans 8, let's go. Romans 8. So I'll just go straight. I'll go straight there in verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose, right? Not our own purpose, not our own shoe bread, his shoe bread, according to his purpose. So what's the purpose of God? That we might be made the righteousness of God in the Lord Jesus Christ, the expiatory death for sin, the perfect sinless sacrifice that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's his purpose for us. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God who are called. To them who are called according to his purpose. Not our purpose, his purpose. Now this expands from that. The overall purpose we've been called is that we might be made the righteousness of God in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the purpose. But we've all got our own purpose as well. We've all got our own office, but the, the overall outcome of the progression of faith is that we are made the righteousness of God in him. The, the, here, in, here in his faith, here in, here in, the just shall live by faith. Faith to faith, the just shall live by faith. The righteousness of God, faith is testimony, and testimony is faith, the word of God. Now, this Greek word sanctify that we get here in 1 Corinthians 1, 2. So for me, this is talking to everybody in the body of Christ. Unto the God, church of God, which is at Corinth, to, to them who are sanctified. G37, in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, right? So holy, separate, called according to his purpose that we will be made the righteousness of God in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we've been called to be these saints we've got the job and now we've got to go and do the job and it's far far more than just pointing out the evils of the world that's just whatever that's the old that's the old we are now we are now serving god in in in, in these carnal bodies of death in planet babylon as we defeat sin in our carnal bodies of death by faith with all that are in every place call upon the name of the lord jesus christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. So this whole this this book of the this book of Corinthians, it's it's addressed to all members of the body of Christ who are being called saints. It's G40 for memory, which is the same Greek word as holy. Called to be saints, called according to his purpose. This is pertaining to all members of the body of Christ, as I see every single last time we see this word sanctified. The body of Christ, no matter who you are, when, what. If you've been called, if you're in the church, you've been sanctified, right? G37. Now, we get this word the 29 times. Sanctify, hallow, and be holy. And we get to render or acknowledge or be venerable or hallow, to separate from the profane things and dedicate to God. Consecrate things to God. Dedicate people to God, right? So it's pertaining to separation. So we're sanctified. We've been separated to serve God according to his purpose, that the righteousness of God be in us through him, through 
his death on the cross. Now that's what we get here with this with this word purify because he took on God's wrath, right? Sin through everything at the Lord Jesus Christ. He became sin itself. It was that profound. The law had to be changed. The Lord Jesus Christ even died the curse and he's not cursed. So we've got a problem. How can he that is not cursed, the only one who is not cursed, how can he die the cursed? What happens here? Well, we need to change the law. And that's what the, that's what the Lord Jesus Christ, the perfect sin offering, that's what it means. The law had to be changed. And now, due to that, we've now been called according to his purpose that the righteousness of God be revealed in us through the Lord Jesus Christ, through the death on the cross. The death on the cross is everything simply because he was resurrected so then the death just becomes so much so much because if if he wasn't resurrected he's just another man who just spoke great things but he was resurrected and at the center of all this at the at center of all this it's critical 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 to believe that the lord jesus christ was resurrected now then we get to purify right so so far it's just talking about being separate so we're all sanctified we're separated to God. So we're the sheep. We're the sheep who have now, and again, it's not about serving the world and hitting your knees and saying you're awake and you're going to run around trying to wake other people up and establish your own righteousness. And that's that's the whole that's the whole purpose of what we're doing. We've appointed ourselves to be running around other, and, and, and telling everybody about, and all you have to do is confess the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and that's it, right? No, that's not where we haven't been separated to. The Lord Jesus Christ, if that's what you think, it's what I think is he's going to look at you and say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, because you're not serving me. You're just, you're drawing to me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. You don't want to know me. You just want to use me to save your own skin for all the wrath that's coming. No, you're not taking up your cross. You're establishing your own righteousness by being awake and what what you see is other people's iniquities, other people's shortcomings. You must go and wake those people up because you know this. There's no God in that. You're not being led. You're not being led by, it's not testimony, it's not faith. Yeah, no, I was woken up by God and now it's my responsibility. No, you can't establish, unless you can establish, you can't establish that the Lord Jesus Christ wants to wants you to go around and run other people, wake, trying to wake other people up. To me, it's a contrary to the teachings of both Paul and the Lord Jesus Christ. And I've got one in, in just a sec that I'll talk about. But anyway, I've got to stay on track. So already this is getting out. My goodness gracious me. So it, we're separated, right? We're separated to serve God according to his purpose, to purify, to cleanse externally, sanctify. So I see this as the, this is the water baptism. And then we get C, to purify internally by the renewing of the soul, sanctify. So I see this one as the progression of faith. And I see this one as the baptism, the water baptism, repentance, being forgiven of sins past. And then due to that, we receive the Holy Ghost, we receive the resurrection, we receive the seed, the word of God, and then we are gifted the progression of faith. But then we've got this second one in the middle. To purify by expiation, free from the guilt of sin right? Free from the guilt of sin. Now, we get a couple of scriptures down here in the Greek lexicon at where it pertains to it. So 1 Corinthians 6, 11, and such were some of you, but ye are washed, right? So we've been sanctified. It's this one here, well, we get it here as well, to purify by expiation, free from the guilt of sin, right? So this is the, this is, we're called according to to his purpose, that purpose, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. This is the expiatory death, the expiatory sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thus now, we've been purified by this expiation because we're free from the guilt of sin. So there's three different things going on here. The water baptism, and now due to that water baptism, we're given the Holy Ghost. And now due to the expiatory death of the Lord Jesus Christ, he became sin for us that knew no sin, that, that the righteous, that's that we, we might be made the righteousness of God in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's our purpose. 
to purify by expiation. So now we have we don't carry that guilt due to that death, due to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thus, we're being purified. And that's what these scriptures are pertaining to here. And now ye are washed, right? And ye are sanctified. And ye are justified by faith in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. And Ephesians 5, 26, that he might sanctify the body of Christ, the church, the household of God, and cleanse it with the washing of water by, by the word, right? So the water is the word. Now, I see that as the Son, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. The water is the word, but I also see this as the seed, right? So it's pertaining to the water baptism, but I'm also seeing it's pertaining to the, to the, to, to, to the, to the blood, the Holy Ghost by which we are also sanctified through the offering of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ once and for all, right? So this is due to the sacrifice, the Lord Jesus Christ being the expiatory sacrifice to take on God's wrath for sin. This word, G37, which is absolutely pivotal for me in all this, and all of us in the body of Christ, we're all sanctified in Christ Jesus. Revelation 7, 14, we're reading of those who have been purified that come out of the, of the tribulation. And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of the great tribulation and have washed, Greek word G4150, the only time we see it, have washed their robes, their garments, and made them white in the blood, of the Lamb. An earthly story with a heavenly meaning, but I find this one difficult to try to apply what the earthly story here might actually be because we're, 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 we've got robes, we've got garments here that are being white, due, made white due to a red blood. I find that difficult to understand, but what this is saying is the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ washes your robes white, and of course the white it's the, it's the righteousness of the saints. It's the outcome of the progression of faith. It is the perfect virgin of Zion, the perfect vir chaste virgin that's being presented, new city, to the Lord Jesus Christ. The outcome of the progression of faith, the seventh angel sounds. Now, these that came out of the great tribulation, they have washed their robes and have made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So this has happened for them, but I see this as also a prophecy to us because our whole life becomes a great tribulation. I know mine has. Our whole life is a great tribulation. I see this as the entertainment doctrine as well, another, another false doctrine that I see. Where it's all very, very exciting to understand when the great tribulation's happening and whether we're in it now and whether it's gonna be a rapture before the millennium and all and all this just just nonsense that I hear over and over again. For us, our progression of faith is a tribulation. If you're not experiencing a great tribulation in your faith, pretty much every day, you ain't fair dinkum. You ain't doing this. For me, every one of us is going through this great tribulation and only those who endure to the end will be saved. Thus, we will come out of this great tribulation. This for me is also a prophecy to all of us and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. So this is past for them, but it's future for us. This is the progression of faith. This is the outcome of the progression of faith, the seed of Jacob from the old to the new, from dark to light, from Lucifer to the Lord Jesus Christ. Old man, first man, Adam, the sinful man, the adversary to God, the enemy of the cross. And now due to the progression of faith, we become Israel, Jacob is the former of all things. The Israel, the lot of his inheritance, the Lord of hosts is his name. That's this progression of faith here. The seed of Jacob have washed, Greek word G4150, with their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb, right? In the blood of the lamb. So he was made sin for us who knew no sin so that we will be made the righteousness of God in him. That's our purpose in the body of God. Christ, the expiatory sacrifice, we're free from that guilt of sin. So now that we can go and serve him, right? Washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. As I say, we only get it the one time. To wash with reference to clothing. Now we get the allegory. Use figuratively of those who by faith so appropriate, right? So that's not appropriate, that's appropriate. 
So this pertains to it's giving it a place. It's appropriating it. Appropriating the results. So the results now have a place. Where's that place? It's everybody that's come out of the Great Tribulation, the trial by faith, the hotbed of filth in, uh, on planet Babylon, who have come out of this Great Tribulation that is our lives, the progression of faith, and have washed their robes. Thus, we've appropriated the results of Christ's expiation as to be regarded by God as pure and sinless, right? So this now is absolutely and utterly epic because at the outcome of the progression of faith, we're now appropriating the expiatory death of the Lord Jesus Christ because he now has regarded us as pure and sinless. That's the gift. So on repentance, you receive the Holy Ghost, but you also receive the resurrection. You're now free from that guilt of sins past. You've been washed clean. So now you've been get you've now you God now looks at us and says, right, you're now in the same state. I now see you just like the Lord Jesus Christ. Sins are gone. Sins out of the way. It's now gone. So now God's looking at us and going, right. Now, now what you now what you I need you to do, what I am commanding you now to do is to go out into the world and appropriate, even justify. I used the word justify a few videos ago, but yeah, that's what I see it. We're justified by faith, but we're justifying the death in mankind in this hotbed of filth, the fry pan of faith in planet Babylon, this hostile environment. God said to us, right, you've now got the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was the perfect sinless sacrifice, and that's what he went and did. Sin's now, it doesn't, it's not there. It's taken out of the way. God now is looking at us as pure and sinless. So just as the Lord, Je the Lord God, the Father, looks at the Lord Jesus Christ, he's now looking at us and says, right, I've now given you that resurrection. I'm now looking at you as pure and sinless. So now I need you to go out there and just give that place. You go out and show the world. Justify, justify what I did. He doesn't need us to justify him, right? But the thing is, this is the thing when you're talking about God and the Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't need anything. He doesn't need anyone. But when he does something or creates something, he has a purpose. He has a need. We've got a purpose. So God has a need for us. That's what I say there. So now go out and just, this is what I've done. Why did you go and do that for us, man? Why did you go and do that? That's just the, the most amazing gift. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about why. Just go out and do it. But why? Why, why, why? The reason why is in this verse. He hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what this word is talking about, to appropriate the results. This is the manifestation. This is the result. I've now gone and done this for you. You're now perfect and sinless in my eyes. So now go and appropriate those results. Go and justify what I've done. And we do that by faith. We do that by faith in the resurrection, in Jesus, in the Father, and in the gospel. That's our mission, to defeat sin in our carnal bodies of death by faith. It's an epic word. These two words, G4150 and G37, just go hand in hand. That's what we are. We're being we're to purify by expurgation. So this has happened for us. We've been purified, free from the guilt of sin, which is this here. We've been, we've been regarded as God, as pure and sinless. We're free from the guilt of sin, by the expiatory death of the Lord Jesus Christ, the perfect sacrifice, we're free from that guilt of sin. We're regarded as God as pure and sinless. And now by faith, we're now bringing forth those fruits. We're appropriating the results of Christ's expiatory death, what he did on the cross, the resurrection. We're actually gifted the resurrection on repentance. This is our purpose. It's not to run around trying to wake other people up, right? It's to walk by faith. It's to walk by testimony. And this is what I say at the start. 
every opportunity we have in our lives, every single last conversation, we must, not going to tell anyone else to do it, but it's my testimony, we must do it in a fear of God, not a fear of the world and not never a fear of carnal implications. The gospel and our testimony must come first and it's my testimony every single last time I've backed the gospel and backed my testimony. I've come out a better man for it, a better man. I actually become a better quality man, but better than that, and better than that, my faith increases. And every time your faith increases, you back it again. And every time you back it again, you receive more testimony. So then you receive more faith, and this is the cycle of life. And this is our purpose. And this is the vein of what this video is going to be about today. So then I look at this verse of the day that I got in Bible, Bible Blue Letter Bible a, a week or so ago. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. I mean, get a load of that. It's everything. The preaching of the cross. It's everything. It's everything. That's our mission. He was made to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. I've now taken sin out of the way. It gives me chills to think about this, man. If there's one thing I want to learn in these scriptures and about the nature of our reality. It's just the power of this resurrection. This was the most significant event in the history of mankind. The crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was indeed an earthquake. It was the old and it was the new. We had an old world and now we've got this new, I say the word new world, but it is. That's the new world now. The old man die, that the new man come alive. This was that for me, that great earthquake that we read about in Matthew 27. The most significant, the most significant event in the history of mankind. Sin now has been taken out of the way. In God's eyes, we're now perfect and sinless because of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, the offense of the cross. We are now, as it was an offense, we read that in scripture, and it's 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 not, not to be for nothing. It has to be. We must, must, must go out and appropriate the results of this. That's our purpose that we've been called to do that we might be made the righteousness of God in him, coming into that perfect understanding of God's perfect will and our perfect understanding of him and his will. But it's in Jesus, right? So everything is about Jesus and what he did, that we might be made the righteousness of God in the Lord Jesus Christ. So the preaching of the cross to them that perish, it is foolishness, but unto us it's saved. It is indeed the power of God, right? Now, this is, in that vein, in that vein, I'm going to share just a couple of chapters now where I feel I am seeing them now a lot more clearly as I go on as a result of my testimony and my faith growing and just how I'm seeing a lot of false doctrines out there. So in, in Luke 18, and he spoke another parable, right? So an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. He spoke this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others, right? Trying to establish your own righteousness through the iniquity of others. What you see as the iniquity of others. Pointing out other people's shortcomings. Pointing out to people that they need to wake up because you're awake, because you're trying to establish your own righteousness. For me, there is absolutely nothing wrong with talking to somebody about the agendas and about the the hoaxes and the like and to talk about flat earth and things like that but for me it's an honor and it's a privilege to be able to talk about that we need to eat the meat that's before us people are drawn to us the more testimony the more that depending on our purpose people are drawn to us and then we then have that honor that privilege in the fear of god to have that conversation they'll say something there'll be an appetite i never bring it up People now, it's a rule of mine, people don't know the first thing about me unless they approach me. That's my office. People have to approach me. It's just how it is for me. Every single every single time, back in those days where I tried to wake somebody up or I tried to, nobody has ever received anything I've ever said, not once. 
The only victory on that level I've ever had is my friend Alex down at the shops. We've become dear friends. He now openly says that he thinks the earth is not a ball. Now, the reason why that happened is because he approached me one day. Our friendship blossomed. He enjoys who I am. He enjoys what I do. He enjoys what I say because he's been led to me by the Holy Spirit. And he's got an appetite for the truth like there's no tomorrow, that bloke, right? And I've, ta I've talked to him, not because I want to try and wake him up or anything like that. It's because in a fear of God, he's been brought forth to me. He's been drawn to me by the Holy Spirit. And then as the conversation goes on, I talk to him about these things because I want him at the end of the day to be in the body of Christ if that's God's will. And at the moment, it's my understanding that it is God's will. So I don't push. It's all on his time and it's all on the Lord Jesus Christ's time. I'm just there as the vessel to be led and to talk to him and to take, yeah, take my tools out of the shed as the Holy Spirit leads me to do. And that's what this is all about, that they trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Now, two men went into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. So the Pharisees now, I'm seeing them as just creatures. I'm seeing that they actually understand the allegory. They understand that the Bible is all about an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, but they're shutting that down. These creatures run in the world like the Pope. They know. They know about that. They just try to keep everybody carnal and they do a very good job carnal and in the flesh. And that's who these Pharisees are. And they are just riddled with self-righteousness. The first man who are just righteous in their own eyes due to their apparent works in the law. Moses, the first man, is their confidence. Thus, they didn't believe the Lord Jesus Christ because they didn't believe the prophets because they were righteous themselves under the law. None of it applies to them in their eyes, right? So one was a Pharisee and the other a publican. So we're just a, a normal one of the great unwashed, right? A sinner. And the Pharisee stood and prayed thus unto himself, God, I thank thee that I'm not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, even as this publican, because I'm so righteous as under my own works by the law, right? I do all these things. And the publican standing afar off would even lift up his eyes into heaven and smoke upon his breast saying, God, be merciful unto me a sinner. I tell you that this man went down to his house, he's justified rather than the other, for everyone that exalts himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Now, a big part of that for me is that I do not want to be exalted. I don't. I don't want the channels to grow. I do not. Very, very happy with how things are. Just want testimony to be led by the Spirit of God and to understand God and his perfect knowledge, a perfect, more, more, never get this right, understand God more, more perfectly and, and come into a more perfect rounding understanding of both him and his will, right? And just to be led by that Spirit of God and just having faith in the resurrection, the Lord Jesus Christ the Father and this glorious gospel. Now, that's, that's sort of what I'm talking about here. So I want to make it absolutely clear that I'm not do when I talk about these other doctrines, that's exactly what I'm talking about. I'm talking about doctrines and I'm talking about deception and those people who are deceived and are, and are, and, and are doing the deceiving has no impact on my salvation whatsoever. I'm not looking at them and I'm not thanking God that I'm not like them. It's nothing like that. I'm just pointing out at the moment due to my testimony what I feel we should be doing. And a big part of that is to cut through these lies and all of these deceptions. I would never, no way would I ever dare. Somebody who's in the fear of God would never pray to God such as this. We absolutely pray to God about what he's done for us. Well, I do about what he's done for us and just how he's refining me and how this progression of faith and just how my faith now is absolutely soaring. I absolutely thank him for that, but it's not because of other, of other people's shortcomings. It's never, ever, ever about that. Now in saying that, sometimes, particularly when I'm out in the car, because I pray when I drive, and I've said this before, if you want to get to understand a person you just put them behind the wheel of a car and you will understand their psyche pretty much since from, from the get-go. You see some people out there and they just 
have to be better than everyone else and have to be faster and tailgate and do all sorts of stupid things because they're so much better and faster. And if they get to be really, really lucky, they get to toot their horns because they're so much better than you made a mistake. You, 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 you. And I'm now going to point, if I'm so much better, I'm now going to point out to you, right? Now I struggle with things like that, but that doesn't make me better than anybody else. I'm not see. I, I freely admit and confess to the Holy Spirit constantly that I used to be like that, but I don't. And now I'm absolutely thankful that I'm not, I'm not like that, no, but it's not about me going, I thank God that I'm not like those other people because I'm so great by my own righteousness, right? No, it's by the progression of faith, looking directly back into that mirror and knowing that old man exactly what I was, right? Giving God the glory and it's all, it's staying humble. It's not about exalting myself. It's about, it's about the progression of faith. And I'm nowhere without my faith and I'm nowhere without my testimony. So that's the vein of what I'm talking about here. It's about doctrines and deceit, but it's not trying to establish my own righteousness in what could be I could see as other people's shortcomings. I see other people's shortcomings all the time, but that has no impact on my faith. It has no impact on my salvation whatsoever. That's what I'm talking about here. So in that vein, that's what I feel the Lord Jesus Christ is talking about here in Matthew 7. This is a chapter that I've been vexed on for a long, long time, and I see it mishandled quite a lot. But I feel now that I'm coming into understand more, more perfect understanding of this scripture. Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. Now, I'm being led to think that the Lord Jesus Christ is talking about this in Luke. Trying to establish your own righteousness due to what you're seeing as iniquity in others. So you're judging them and going, well, look, look, look at you. I see it with my affliction all the time. People go out there and they're like, oh, you sinners, look at this. Look at how sinful, sinful, sinful you are. They're pouring out their heart. Please, please, please repent. And all they're doing is lecturing other people and they're not getting themselves sorted. And that for me is what the Lord Jesus Christ is saying here. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but you don't consider the beam that's in your own eye. That's what he's talking about. This is talking about judging other people, establishing your own righteousness through what you're perceiving as the unrighteousness of others, thinking you're better because of what you're seeing as shortcomings in others. And for me, running around trying to wake people up, is a it's a part of this. I've got this information and I'm seeing you need it because I said, not because God's leading me to do it, and that's the, it, for me, it's a form of judgment by doing that. And again, I'm not judging the people that do that. I'm judging the, dece the deception. I'm judging the doctrine. Just trying to put down, well, this is where this gets really, really hard, but I need to make it absolutely clear that none of this is by my own work. None of it. None of it. Well, I've, it's by testimony. I've got to execute the works, but it's the testimony and it's me being led by backing the gospel. They're the perfect works that we talk about in Ephesians 2. I want to make it absolutely clear, that's not what I'm doing. Just trying to cut through the deception here, just to put down what I'm being led to think our purpose is here. And that's so that the righteousness of God will be revealed in us through the expiatory death of the Lord Jesus Christ, bringing forth the fruits of righteousness. That's what he's talking about, because that's what he says. And why not behold the moat that is in thy brother's eye? So you're judging other people and you're not sorted yourself. Or how, I said, I'll keep going. Or how will they say to their brother, let me pull the moat out of thine eye and behold the beam that is in thine own eye, right? Now, I see this as, I said it last video, if you're a chronic alcoholic or a chronic drug taker, how can you possibly help that person get clean or get sober while you're still a rampant alcoholic or drug user, right? You got to go and get the beam out of your own eye first. And how do you do that? Well, you do that by saying, God, please be merciful to me, a sinner. Sort me, sort me. Please give me this progression of faith. Please give me, this is, this is godly, sorrowful repentance of the first man. He is pulling the beam 
out of his own eye by doing this. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam from thine own eye and then, right? Big conjunction word. And then thou shalt see clearly to cast out the mote from thy brother's eye. So the Lord Jesus Christ, he doesn't want us, he doesn't not want us helping others at any point. No, 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 no. We've got to repent. We repent and we will be gifted the Holy Ghost. We will be gifted the progression of faith. And then God, the Holy Spirit, is going to use us by drawing people to us to be able, he's going to give us our office to be able to preach the gospel, to bring forth, to appropriate the expeciary death of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's now going to give us that opportunity. But we must get ourselves sorted first. We must cast the moat from our eye out first, and then we're going to be able to help. Give not that which is holy to the dogs, neither cast your pearls before the swine, lest they trample them under their feet and again rend them, rend them and, and turn again and rend you, right? Now, this happened to me over and over again when I was running around trying to wake people up. They make me feel, they, they make you feel like an idiot. I saw a comment the other day on a news article. I'll see if I can pull it up. I saw a comment on a news article where a person just said, no, elections are selections. And I look at it and I think those people who are sound asleep, they're going to read that comment and they're going to think just the guy's just a raving lunatic. It hasn't helped. It hasn't helped. What that person for me has gone and done, and again, I'm not judging, I'm observing because I'm not better by as a result of that what that person's done. But what they've done is they've pushed that person further away because they just think, you're an idiot. Why would you say something like that? Of course, democracy's real. Well, of course, elections are real. You're one of those crazy people who claim elections are rigged, right? And that's what happens is that they just trample it. They, they, you're casting your pearls before the swine. You're running around trying to wake people up, establishing your own righteousness because you're better, because you've got this information. You're so much better and you're not being led by the Spirit of God. That's for me is what the Lord Jesus Christ is talking about here. Go and get yourself sorted. The first step, repentance. And then we get it again here in Philippians 2, an amazing testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ being obedient by faith unto the, unto the cross, right? That was his purpose. The Lord Jesus Christ, his whole life was to be the perfect sinless, sinless sin offering. And he had to be here, did it by faith. And he was obedient all the way to the cross. And now, due to that, due to that expeciary death of the Lord Jesus Christ, our mission, our purpose is to is to appreciate, appropriate, appropriate that, that, that expeciary death of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's our purpose. We've been washed clean due to that. That was the whole life of the Lord Jesus Christ. That was his mission. And he was obedient all the way to the end, as we do now too. We're now sinless in God's eyes. That's who we are. So now we've, we're to bring forth that fruit. And now I'll come straight down to, yeah, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only. So it's interesting, right? I feel that Philippians are very, very sorted indeed. They are very, very senior in the church. As you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, right? Work out your own salvation. It's one-on-one, -on -one, us with the Lord Jesus Christ, going out and getting yourself sorted by faith and then right? You'll be able to help other people cast the moat that's out of their eyes because the first step of that is by repentance. That's what this is here. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Got to go and get ourselves, got to go and get ourselves sorted. Second Corinthians 4, just going to touch on it because I've got to start track. So I've got quite a bit, bit more that I want to, that I want to put down. So we've been given the Holy Ghost. Now, we've got that treasure. So this is part of that is the resurrection. We've been gifted the resurrection. So now we've been, we've been washed clean of our sins, the guilt of those sins, because in God's eyes, we're now sinless. And we're now without blemish due to the expiatory death of the Lord Jesus Christ, that the righteousness of God be revealed in us 
through the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's this treasure we have in the earthen vessels that that excellency might be of the power of God and not of us. It's all about testimony and it's all about faith. Who do you fear? Do you fear God or do you fear the world? What do you fear most? Do you fear how you thought about that person, how you spoke about that person or the next agenda that's coming along? Are you looking at the Lord Jesus Christ and saying, please, please see me right and please forgive me. I come with a heavy heart repenting. I didn't get that right. I didn't get that conversation right. I didn't get that thought right. I didn't get that interaction right. I didn't, I didn't get it right. Or please save me. Please, please save me from the wicked in the world, right? It's this one. It's this one. It's, it's fearing. It's fearing God. It's not fearing the world. It's like, I look at the agendas on the world sometimes and I'm like, I'm confident that you're going to keep me and you're going to allow me to walk in the gospel. And I know in my heart that you're going to use that so that you can refine my faith by increasing my testimony, right? I want to get this right. I want to get my conversations right. I want to get my thoughts right because the excellency is the power may be of God and not of us. And this is the progression of faith. This is what I say. If you're not going through a tribulation every day of the week, you ain't fair income, right? And that's what we see here. Always bearing about in the body, the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. That's what this is pertaining to. The expeciary death, the, the, the appropriating, appropriating just that gift the Holy Spirit's given us. He's given us the resurrection so that the life of Jesus can be made manifest in our body. The progression of faith. That the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh because we're delivered unto death for Jesus' sake. Right? Jesus' sake. That's this. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him for Jesus' sake. Jesus' sake is the expecia his expeciary death, so now the righteousness of God is made manifest in us, in him, through us. So the progression of faith, we might be made the righteousness of God, the outcome of the progression of faith, and then we come back to that word, the results of Christ's expeciation as to be regarded by God as pure and sinless. So this has happened Due to, the, due to the, the, the sin offering of the Lord Jesus Christ, this has taken place and now we're appropriating the results of Christ's expiation. And we're, we're delivered into death every day for Jesus' sake so that we can appropriate the glory, justify God in what he did by taking sin out of the way. That's the gift. That's the gift, and now this is what I need, and I'm commanding you to go out and do. And we've got this treasure in earth and vessels that the excellency might be the power of God and not us. I can go days, weeks, apart from Alex, and I shouldn't say apart from because he's just become a big part of my life, but I, I have before he come along, I can go weeks, weeks without any conversation of any substance because I'm not being led to do it. Just stay calm, stay rooted in faith, continue to read scripture and continue just to, 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 to gather testimony and increase faith. Continue to gather, gather, gather and just having confidence and faith that I'm executing my office because if I ain't, it's certainly my testimony that I get a chastening. What's a chastening? Something happens in your life unexpected, unexpected. It happened to me that day I got accosted by the police. It was two days before the end of the lockdown I got all the way through to the end and I went into Woolies and there was a policeman there and he just, he nicked me for not having a face mask on in public and I was shattered. My faith took a massive hit that day, but I remember as I was walking out, I was thinking to myself, man, I feel good. I'm the only person in this shop who's free. And I, that's how I was thinking. I was getting puffed up. I was becoming Uzziah, man. I needed to be brought down a peg or two. It was a chastening. And that's how it happened. You think you become confident and you become vain in your own imagination and you lose focus and you forget the Lord. You don't forget the Lord, but you think just you take your eyes off this and you start to it starts to become your own power. 
that you're doing this. You just become, you feel bulletproof, right? You lose that reverence of the Lord. He pulls you back. He pulls you back every time by a chastening. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. What's this treasure? It's to appropriate the results of the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ by faith. Walking in the gospel, having faith in the gospel, faith in the resurrection. Not by our own hands, not casting our pearls to swine, not establish our own righteousness as what we see in the iniquity of others. And for me, that's including trying to wake other people up who don't want to be woken up. God's going to send them a delusion. So if we're trying to wake people up who don't want to be woken up, how is God going to send them a delusion? To me, you're going against the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ if you're doing that. And also, you're casting your pearls before swine. There's two scriptures I see that it's just forbidden to try and wake people up by your own hands. You let, let, let another one. Let them that be filthy continue to be filthy. It's not our job. Our job is to be led by the Holy Spirit and to gather testimony and preach the gospel and bring forth the fruits. It's got to be obvious that we're walking with the Lord Jesus Christ. Those that have known us for a long time, it becomes very, very obvious to them that something, something significant is going on in your life. This one in 1 Peter 4, verse 11 I read this a couple of reads ago and I thought, my, 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 this is epic. And now I'm starting to understand. I'm just starting to understand why now on a whole new level. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God, right? So we're speaking the word of God. If any man speak, let him speak the word of God. If any man minister, so if any man serve, let him do it as of the ability. So the God-given abilities, our testimony our seed. He, he ministers seed for the sower and bread. Grace. Let him do, I can't believe that's the first time I've said that word. Grace. It's all about grace. Let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, right? Our God-given testimony. So if any man serve, let him do it as the ability which God gives. And when we speak, we're speaking the word of God because we fear God and we're bringing forth the fruits, the results of of the of the of the perfect sin offering, the expiatory death, the expiatory death of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're appropriate, we're justifying God by doing that, by taking sin out of the way. Let Him do it, right? So we're speaking by the Word of God, and we're serving, and we're doing those things as the ability, testimony, faith, grace that God gives. That God. Now check this out. That God. So the reason why we're doing this is so that God in all things may be glorified through, right? Through Jesus Christ, to whom be the praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So the reason why we're speaking the word of God, so we've been given the Holy Ghost. First, Second Corinthians 4, we've been given the seed and that we've got the treasure in earth and vessels that the power may be of God and not of us. So we're speaking the seed. We're speaking the word of God. Now, when we serve, because that's we're humbling ourselves and we're servants, we're not rulers. If any man serve, minister, let him do it at his mouth. Let him do it as of the ability. So grace, the word that we're given, testimony we're given, faith we're given, which God gives that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ that God may be glorified in all things through Jesus Christ. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's why we're doing this. Everything is about God being glorified through Jesus Christ, who was the perfect sin offering, the, the speciary death for sin. So God made him sin for us who knew no sin. Why? That we might be made the righteousness of God in him, in the Lord Jesus Christ, in Jesus, through Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ, right? God giveth that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ because we've been gifted the resurrection. So powerful, man. It is just so, so powerful. The fear of God or 
the fear of the world. Now check this out. Beloved, beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. So it's it's normal for us, and this is the, this is the great tribulation. And those of us who come out of that great tribulation, we're going to demonstrate the righteousness of God through the expiatory death of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to appropriate. God has given us this unspeakable gift so that the righteousness of God will be made in us, we will be made the righteousness of God, the outcome of the progression of faith, the end of the great tribulation that is our faith. If you're not going through this great tribulation all the time, you're not fair dinkum. You're not submitting yourself to the righteousness of God and you're not looking for testimony and you're not, for me, anyway, I don't want to condemn and judge, but that's what this is here. It's not some strange thing, the fiery trial, nut, nut, nut. It's it's this, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He made us sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. It's all about the resurrection. It's all about bringing forth the fruits of the resurrection that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ. God's not going to be glorified through Jesus Christ by constantly trying to wake people up who don't want to be woken up and constantly just talking about conspiracies and just getting more and more miserable about it, trying to establish your own righteousness through the evils of the world and what you're seeing as iniquity in others. It ain't that. It's been the, the righteousness of God is revealed. The just shall live by faith. Faith in the in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, the, 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 the death, resurrection, and the, and, the, and the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ and faith in the gospel and it's walking in the gospel and knowing and having faith that not only will the Lord Jesus Christ allow us to do it, it's the very command that we do do it and then when we do do it, we're, God, God is then going to be glorified through Jesus Christ due to the expiatory death of the Lord Jesus Christ. So then I, I see a scripture like this now that I got in King James Online also on Monday, the same day I got the psalm. And it just makes, again, it just makes sense now. 1 John 5, 14. And this is the confidence we have in him, right? The confidence we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, right? He heareth us. What's his will? It's that we bring forth, we appropriate we appropriate the results of us being forgiven and washed clean of all of our sins and our sins taken out of the way. God's now not looking us as, as sinners. He's looking us at, at us as clean. It's hard to even fathom, but we no longer carry that guilt and we're to submit ourselves to his righteousness, hearing the testimony, humbling yourself, getting the police and just going back to God with my heart in my hand going, why, 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 why has this happened? And as I smoke my breast, right? And it's like, it's not, a, it's not establishing my own righteousness. It's just, it, it's, it's establishing my testimony. And just, that's what we do. We just put ourselves heart, heart in here. Every time I have to stare the purple dragon in the face, that's one of the last things I say before I do it. I say to the Holy Spirit, I say, all right, my heart is in is in my hands and I'm handing it to you. And all I'm going to do is just have faith in you and by walking in the gospel. Not trying to say, not wanting to say anything in any conversation, not having anything necessarily ready, just going in there and listening and letting situations come to me and, and just throwing the gospel at it. Having confidence in the gospel, confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ. But I see this as well. It, this is the confidence, right? Confidence, faith, trust, fear that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. Now, this is what I say. We can't have, we can't have the progression of faith if we, if, we, if we have an understanding, a perfect understanding of God's will. Otherwise, we're in the Garden of Eden and how is it faith? We know, what's, we know what, he, what he wants every time. So how is it by faith, right? 
Now for me, as we grow in faith, this is the outcome and I'm starting to find more and more and more that my will just happens to be God's will. I'm starting to see that more and more. And it's incredible because then once the church has an understanding of God, a perfect understanding of God and his perfect will, that's when the seventh angel sounds. That's when all of this is over. That for me is one of my biggest missions in life is to understand God's will and understand and have a perfect knowledge of him. You're not going to do that just by running around trying to wake people up thinking that's what we've got to do and not and not changing at all. Not changing at all. Constantly talking about conspiracy theories and the only time we talk about the Lord Jesus Christ is when we're begging him to save our skin. It's not what this is, right? It's not what this is. So back in Philippians 2, and this in verse 3, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let us esteem other better than themselves. That for me is just an, an, an epic piece of scripture. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. We're not looking to exalt ourselves. We're just looking for the we're just looking for the voice of the Holy Spirit to execute his commands and our purpose that he's bestowed us with. And we're actually esteeming others better than them than ourselves. This goes to the fear of God for me. Absolutely. And being those that are humble will be exalted and those that exalted will be humbled and those that exalt themselves will be cast out. So this is, as I say, this is a huge piece of scripture where the Lord Jesus Christ, he humbled himself and became obedient unto the death, even to the death of the cross. What an example, right? Wherefore God has highly exalted him. So he humbled himself and now God has exalted him because he did nothing through strife or vainglory, being obedient to the death, right? There was no, look at me, look at me, look at me with the Lord Jesus Christ. There was there was none of that with him, right? Not trying to establish his own righteousness. And he went to the pains, particularly in John, to talk about this. He hasn't come to bear witness of himself. He's come to bear witness of his father who sent him. So he humbled himself. What an example. And he was obedient to the to the death, even to the cross. So now God has highly exalted him and has given him a name, which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, right? So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and of things in earth and things under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, I haven't yet found rest on that because for me, I can't see where every tongue's going to do this because there's going to be some that don't repent and, be, and thus are going to be cast into the lake of fire. So I haven't yet found rest on this. But any tongue that does confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, we're not going to lead them to that by doing anything that's about the work of our own hands. The Holy Spirit's going to allow, he's going to allow us to work as he brings people forward to us as we grow in faith. Nobody, for me, it's my testimony that nobody is going to do this by running around trying to wake people up and just talking about conspiracies all day and just saying all you've got to do is hit your knees and Jesus will save you, right? You've got to actually get to know him. Might their heart, their their heart is far from me, but they, they speak they speak about me, they confess me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, right? So then wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, but not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So I've often said that being a soldier in Christ. It's grassroots. It's about your immediate environment, but it's about you. For me, it's about me. It's not about others. It's about me. And for you, it's about you. You have to work out that, uh, your, your own salvation. This is what I say. If you're, a drug, if you're a chronic drug user or alcoholic, you're no use to no one while you're on the juice or while you're on the gear. But man, if you get off it, you're the best one in the world. And that's what we get in 1 Corinthians 1, that he's chosen the most, just the most unlikely people. For me, the more powerful your testimony is, the, the, the more just in darkness you were, 
before the Holy Spirit came to get you, the more powerful the testimony is and the more, for me, you can help others. And that, that's the whole point of that for me, that he's just taken the most, just the most vile. And I, I'm not going to say, I'm not saying I was vile before, but I certainly have needed this. That That's for sure. You look back and you just, I revile at the person that I once was. I tell you what, I've, I've just about, just about, I have, I've, I've had it with this globe stuff, um, globe earth, flat earth, I'm, I've, I've, I've reached the end of my limit with this shit. Now this is going out to people who believe the earth is a globe and, comp and, and, and profess to be walking with Christ because I've just about had enough with you. I really have. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Now what's the deep you think? And the, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now, what are the waters? What's the deep and what's the waters? Is that space? Is that galaxies? Is that light years? Is that planets? And God said, let there be light and there was light. So there's a couple of verses here where it's not really relevant to the water and the shape of the earth. But Genesis 1, uh, 6. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let the, let, and, and let it divide the waters from the waters. So how do the rockets get through? If you believe the Earth's a globe, that means you believe in space travel. You believe in NASA. You believe they're traveling to other galaxies. I know. I seem upset because I am. I've had it with this. I've had it up to my teeth with this, with this subject. Absolutely, absolutely revile of it. So we're, we're to get our own selves sorted first. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. We've got to, we've got to get ourselves sorted. Now this in 13. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure, right? His good pleasure. And this is this here in Romans 8. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. So do you love God? God knows the hearts. Only God knows the hearts, right? Good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. Not our own self-appointed purpose, his purpose. How do we get to know what his purpose is? It's by testimony. It's absolutely my testimony that it's by testimony that we start to understand what our purpose actually is. And as I've gone on and on, it's just gotten clearer and clearer to me as to what my purpose actually is. So the, everything works to the good of them that are called according to his purpose. And it's God that works in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. That, another epic conjunction word, you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of the crooked and perverse nation of whom you shine as lights in the world. Now, this is what's going to save us in the day of wrath. Not hitting our knees and begging that the Lord Jesus Christ saves us from the evil to come. No, it's doing all things without murmurings and disputings, gathering testimony, being good to that testimony and obey, obeying the, the gospel at all times. That's how we progress in every situation is just by obeying this gospel as we bring forth the fruits of the Lord Jesus Christ expeciary sacrifice for he had made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So now we've been absolutely washed clean from the guilt of those sins. And now the command is to bring forth those fruits. So now go and demonstrate what I've now gone and done for you. You've now got this purpose and it's to bring forth the fruits of the spirit that you may be blameless and harmless, right? So this is the outcome of the progression of faith. Once we've been washed clean of those sins through the water baptism, then we receive the gift of the Holy Ghost and the gift of the resurrection, and then it's game on. Then we start to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling, for it's the testimony, the Holy Ghost that works in us to do of His good pleasure, His purpose for us, 
Now go out and do it. Don't be a murmurer. Don't be a Jonah. That, this is the outcome of the progression of faith, that you will be saved in the day of wrath. That's what this is all about. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. It's the whole purpose of why we're here. That's why we're here, so that we're going to be made the righteousness of God in the Lord Jesus Christ as we demonstrate and we bring forth the fruits of the Lord Jesus Christ's sacrifice. I mean, what an honor, what a blessing, but my, 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 the fear of God is absolutely essential. Absolutely essential in all this. For who you fear is who you revere. Who you revere is who you serve and who you trust. Now, I got this one through, my goodness, on Friday as I went to bed in King James Online. I mean, this now just blows my mind. Check this one out. Isaiah 44, 22. I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions. Why? Why has the Holy Spirit done that, right? It's pretty clear, right? It's pretty clear why the Holy Spirit's gone and done that. And as a, as a cloud, thy sins return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. It's all according to God's purpose, and it's all for the Lord Jesus Christ. That God be glorified in the Lord Jesus Christ. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that you may be the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom you shine as lights in the world. You know, it's it's interesting. I, I don't quite know how to say this, but I'll just say it. I remember I used to say the words for Christ's sake a lot in my old man, particularly when I hit a bad golf shot. I used to say it a lot, right? And I just, I'm absolutely mortified by that now because this is the whole purpose of why the man is on the earth, is for Christ's sake. It's just amazing, right? And this is, this is you hear people use his name where it shouldn't be used constantly. It's a curse and my goodness gracious, mate, everything. So whenever we do a good work in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in faith, it's so the Lord, that, that, that means the Lord Jesus Christ is being glorified. God's being glorified in the Lord Jesus Christ because we're the body of Christ. And that's, that's the thing here. In, in, in the, the only way this can happen is if we execute our office according to the gospel. It's the only way it's going to happen for me on the earth because we're his messengers, right? This is, this is the whole duty of the, this is why we're here. For he was made sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. It's just so powerful. And you look at this, that's why he's blotted out our transgressions. This is his purpose. This is his will. This is his his, his need for us, his requirement of us. This is why he's done it. So that Lord Jesus Christ, will God will be glorified in the Lord Jesus Christ as we bring forth the fruits of his expeciary death. He took on God's wrath for sin. It's just amazing, this story. It's just getting more and more just absolutely the most amazing story. The Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible, the nature of our reality. It's just becoming more and more amazing to me as I as I go on. And that's the thing. And I'm being red hot on people who are just sitting around talking about conspiracy theories, but that's the difference. You get into those scriptures and you want the Holy Spirit, Spirit and you want the progression of faith, you ain't going to be sitting around just talking about you know, chemtrails and all these things that have happened in the past, you'd, no, it, it, it's, okay, whatever. That's how I look at it all now. It's whatever. Every now and then I might get compelled to do a video about something because I've observed something of the world, but that's all it is. It's just me pointing out my own, my own thoughts on particular agendas, but that's going to do nothing for my righteousness. It's just every now and then I feel compelled to share something, you know. But I see it over and over again that the only time people talk about Jesus is when they're talking about the evils in the world. And for me, that's not what this is. This is this is where we have this is where this has to take place. So the fiery trial is not the evil of the world for me. The ivory the, the fiery trial is is about us being broken and reborn. 
us as individuals. This is just the backdrop. It has to happen here. It has to happen in this carnal world that's been made for sin. This is where it actually has to take place. And it's not about just repelling the evils of the world all the time. That's a part of it. But it's about us. It's about us being broken and reborn. This is the great tribulation. The great tribulation, yes, a part of the great tribulation is getting through all the evils of the world. But we're only going to do that by walking in the gospel. And we can only walk in the gospel if we've been broken and reborn. The fiery trial, it's not, it's, no, it's not. And I'm starting to see all of these agendas now on a whole new level, just why they do it. Why are they doing it? How do the agendas make you feel? When you see something happen in the world, how does it actually make you feel? Now, what I've decided to do is I'm going to split this video because clearly I'm not going to get it all done. I'm going to split it and come back to it in my next video. And for the rest of this video, I'm just going to put down where a fear of God prevents, prevents sin. And I just want to talk about too how we're actually visitors from heaven. So we're visitors from heaven and we're speaking the heavenly things, not the earthly. So... By, for me, by talking about the world constantly and just pointing out the evils of the world, you're talking about the world. That's not the heavenly kingdom. That's not going to be in the heavenly kingdom. When we're in the heavenly kingdom, we're not going to be talking to each other about how the sky looks and how all these evil agendas and the shape of the earth and, and all the rest of it. That's not what we're going to be doing. All those things are important, absolutely, because that it goes to the true nature of our reality. And the more we know about it, absolutely the better. But the, that's not the kingdom of heaven. Those things are going to be absent. The kingdom of heaven is not here. It's not here. Seek the things that are above, not the things that are below. Whoever you fear is who you trust. And it's also who you serve. And you've only got the heavenly kingdom or you've got Babylon. You've got the first man or you've got the second man. Who do you fear? Who do you fear? Do you fear the world? Do you revere the world? Is the world your attention, the first man, or is the second man your attention? Do you fear that first man? I fear that first man in terms of I don't want that first man to prevail here. I'm afraid. My second man is afraid of what that first man can do. And we can only suppress that fear and defeat that first man by having that reverence. I don't revere that first man, but I fear what that first man can most certainly still do to me. I fear God, and I'm confident that God will absolutely annihilate that first man. Who do you fear? I fear God. I fear God, and getting, getting this right. We, in the body of Christ, we simply must get this right. The progression of faith is absolutely everything. So we're visitors from heaven speaking the heavenly things, not the earthly things. Ecclesiastes 12, this is huge, right? So we'll go straight to 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil, right? So fear God. Fear God and keep his commandments. What are the commandments? To love the Lord thy God with all your mind, heart and soul and to love thy neighbour as thyself. And a part of all that is to have faith and it's to have confidence in the gospel and trust the expiatory death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that only comes by having a fear of God. This is the whole duty of man. Fear God and keep his commandments. Two things, fear God and keep his commandments. So fear God is absolutely huge. Now this in Deuteronomy 10, and now Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee, but to fear the Lord thy God. So the whole duty of man is to fear God and keep his, keep his commandments. Now Israel, what does the Lord God require of thee? To fear the Lord thy God and to walk in his ways and to love him and serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. Serving the heavenly things, not serving the earthly things. Who's got your heart? 
the first man or the or the Holy Spirit, the second man? Who's got your heart? And then this one in Ecclesiastes 3, I have seen the travail which God hath given to the sons of men to be exercised in it. Now, that word travail is Hebrew word H6045. Very interesting to note that the only time we see this word is in the book of Ecclesiastes. It's the only time we see it. We see it the eight times and it's travail and business, occupation, task, and job. I have seen the travail. So our business, our office, our occupation, our job. I have seen the travail which God hath given to the sons of men to be exercised in it. Exercised is Hebrew word H6031. We see this word, the, 84 times. Afflict, right? Afflict. We get that 50 times. Humble, force, humble, force, exercise, sin, let oath, troubled, weakened, and 11 miscellaneous. To be occupied, be busied with. So it's our business again. But we get to afflict, to oppress, to humble, be afflicted, and be bowed down. Now, when we come into the Brown Driver Briggs, that we get Ecclesiastes 3.10 here, and it's pertaining to that, to be occupied by, our occupation to be occupied with. So it, again, it's our business, but it's also, it's also pertaining to being humbled and afflicted and bowed down. So this goes to the death of the first man. We have to be broken. It's all about our own salvation that the Holy Spirit is working in us. Work out your own salvation through fear and trembling. I have seen the travail which God has given the sons of men to be exercised in it. This is so powerful. He hath made everything beautiful in his time. He hath set the world in their hearts. Right, so check this out. So this is the first man. This is the first man, the wisdom of that first man. And we've got that world in our heart. That's who we serve. That's who we revere. Everybody that does not have the Holy Spirit, it doesn't matter if you hate these creatures running the world or not. That's your confidence is the world. There's nothing outside this world and you're completely deceived still. You're completely deceived. You've got no idea of any of these conspiracies that I'm talking about. You, you still revere the world. You're still a child of the world and you're still serving the world and you still fear the world because you fear the flesh. And that's Satan. One of Satan's biggest devices is that people fear the flesh. That's why he wants people just in fear constantly. But check this out. He set the world in their heart so that no man, so, so that, right, conjunction words. The reason why he set the world in their heart so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning of the end. It's just monumental. And this comes into 1 Corinthians 2, where he's now given us his Holy Spirit so that we can get to know him. Amazing stuff. I know that there is no good in them, but for a man to rejoice and to do good in his life. And also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of his labor. It is a gift of God. Now this, I know that, Whatsoever God does, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor nothing can be taken from it. And God doeth it that, another conjunction word, men should fear before him. So every single last thing that the Holy Spirit's done from the history of the world, the history of the creation, in the creation itself, in you and me, is that so we will fear him. It's absolutely critical. Now, Israel, what does the Lord thy God require of thee but to fear the Lord thy God and to fear God and to keep his commandments? This is the whole duty of man and God. Everything that he's done is that so man should fear before him. So a fear of the Lord is everything, everything. Proverbs 16, the preparations, I've done a video on this before, I'm back here again. So the preparation of the heart of man and the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. It's amazing, right? So it's about your relationship with the Lord. Now, if you fear the Lord, your tongue is going to be bringing forth the fruits of the spirit, character traits of the heavenly kingdom, because we fear the Lord. We don't 
fear the world. We don't fear the carnal. We don't fear the flesh. We don't fear those creatures. They haven't got our heart. All the ways of a man are clean in his own ways, but the Lord weigheth the spirits. Get this one. Commit thy works to the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. It's so powerful. The Lord hath made all things for himself, yea, even the wicked, for the day of evil. Like, even, even the spirits, even the spirits know who God is. He's made, that's why he's made them for the day of the evil. We don't fear them, right? We fear God. For everyone that is proud in heart. Now, this is about rainbow flags, right? This is about gay pride marches, right? No. I see this as Moab. For everyone that is pr proud in heart, right? So the preparations of the heart of man and the answer of the tongue is for the Lord. Everyone that is proud in heart. Now, you're going to be proud in heart because you don't fear God. You fear the world. You revere the world. You're a child of the world. You either fear God or you fear the world. You either serve the first man or you serve the second man. When I say you serve the second man, that means you're serving God and you're thus you're doing good by to your second man. You're actually fit, you're actually serving that second man by serving the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he wants us to do, to reap, to sow, so we reap to life eternal. But we, we, we are most certainly serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though hand join in hand, he shall not be unpunished. By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. And by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. So how do we stop sinning? It's to fear the Lord thy God. And everything that the Lord's done is so that men would fear before him. The duty, the whole duty of man is to fear God and do his commandments. And that's what the Lord Jesus, that's what the Lord God, the Lord Jesus Christ re re requires of Israel is to fear the Lord and to do his commandments. Fear the Lord and walk in this glorious gospel. That is the whole duty of man. And then this one in Exodus 20, where we're getting the, the Ten Commandments. And Moses said to the people, fear not, right? Fear not, for God has come to prove you. So the trial by faith, to test you. He's come to prove you. So I, this goes to the testimony of Jacob, the seed of Jacob, and that his fear might be before your faces, that you sin not. So there it is there, right? By fear of the Lord, men depart from evil, and that means that you're no longer sinning. You're now du doing the whole duty of man, fear the Lord, and do his commandments. It's about who you fear. It's absolutely essential. John 18. Yes, I get to use these two scriptures that saved me. I was sitting in a park and one minute I didn't know Jesus. I was looking because I knew deep in my heart that he was the answer. And then after I was led to these two glorious pieces of scripture, from that day on, my life was never the same again. Here we go. Yes, I get to share those again. John 18, 36, 37. So he's before Pontius Pilate. Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world, right? So my kingdom is not of this world. So we're not serving this world. We're serving the Lord Jesus Christ's kingdom, which is not this world, right? So it's not running around trying to wake people up about the evils of the world. It's by serving the Lord Jesus Christ by faith. If my kingdom were of this world, then, another conjunction word, if my kingdom were of this world, well then, my servants would fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from thence. Nobody's fighting for him because he's not of this world. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? And Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end, was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. So the truth isn't just the evil of the world. No, no, no. The truth is about the Lord Jesus Christ's kingdom not being from thence, and the whole purpose why we're on this kingdom of sin is that so we will be made the righteousness of God in him. The perfect sinless sacrifice, the expiatory death of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. This is his purpose that we've been called for. 
as we work out our own salvation with fear and trembling, do all things without murmurings and disputings, that in the day of wrath. This is why we have been called. It is God that worketh in you to both do the will and his will and of his good pleasure. And that is serving the kingdom that's not of this world. And then this one in Hebrews 11, the roll call of faith. So we're talking about the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And for me, I'm being led to think all of those that came before, all the, these all died in faith. And it's talking about, it's talking about Noah and Enoch and Abel. These all died in faith. So I'm being led to think it's talking about everybody, but it's most certainly before. It's, it's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all them before. But in any case, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them, of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. So the Lord Jesus Christ's kingdom is not of this world. We're not serving this world. We're serving the, the Lord Jesus Christ's kingdom, which is not this world. And that's us here. This for me is us here. We're also confessing. A big part of that is confessing that we are strangers and pilgrims on the world, in the earth, on the earth. We don't serve the world. We serve the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you're just talking about conspiracies all the time and trying to wake people up about the evil, for me, you're still serving the world. Because that's not the heavenly kingdom. That's the world. The evil of the world is the world. The Lord Jesus Christ's kingdom is not of this world. We're serving that kingdom as the strangers and pilgrims on the earth. We're serving the... the, the, the we're not serving this world. We're serving the kingdom that's above, right? So they confess and we confess that we're strangers and pilgrims on the earth, bringing forth the fruits of the spirit in carnal bodies of death as we defeat sin in these carnal bodies of death by faith. So that word pilgrims is Greek word G3927. We get it these three times. So it's very, very, it's very, very significant to note to me that that's who Peter's addressing. Peter's addressing the scattered strangers. For me, Peter is most certainly addressing us, the scattered strangers, the strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Now, this word, it's broken up into four parts, but for me, one, two, and three come together in four. So we're talking about one that comes from a foreign country. The foreign country is four, a stranger, which is we're from four. Sojourning in a strange place, a foreigner. In the New Testament, so we get the metaphor, we get the allegory. In the New Testament, in reference to heaven as the native country. So one who comes from a foreign country, heaven. One of the many, many scriptures that are starting to pile up for me now that tells me we're pre-existing beings. Because we're strangers and pilgrims on the earth and we're serving the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is not of this world. So we're strangers and pilgrims on the earth and it's pertaining to heaven as the native country, one who sojourns on the earth. That's exactly who we are. We're strangers and pilgrims on the earth. The foreign country is the earth. Our home country is heaven. Our home country is the Commonwealth of Israel, which is the kingdom that the Lord Jesus Christ is talking about here. And anybody that hears his voice is of the truth and is of that heavenly kingdom. And conspiracies and evil in the world is not that kingdom where bringing forth the fruits of a world that is not of this world. We are the strangers and pilgrims on the earth. So now coming back to this Bible verse of the day I got in the in the big calendar on Friday, 1 Peter 5, 8. Now be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Now, we come back to the scriptures in Ecclesiastes and Deuteronomy and Exodus. To fear God and to do his commandments is the whole duty of man. Now, I look at all of these agendas that are being poured out on the earth right now. As it pertains to the body of Christ, 
I'm starting to see them in a whole new way indeed that part of what they're designed for is to trip up us up. So we stop fearing God and we stop doing God's commands. Repelling that evil is one thing, but it's how we feel and it's how we react and it's what we fear. The heart, the absolute heart. It's not the words, it's the heart. Only God knows the hearts, right? So I see this, be sober, be vigilant because your adversary, right? The adversary, our enemy, the enemy of the cross, the devil, Satan, as a roaring lion, he walks about seeking whom he may devour. And a big one for this is to not have faith in the gospel and to not have faith in the expeciary death of the Lord Jesus Christ and start to fear the world, start to fear these agendas and this one in ephesians 4 a huge piece of scripture that i just i don't know i just need to stay on track there's there's just so much here because we're talking about the edifying of the body of christ till we come to the unity of faith so this for me is the end of the command us becoming one in one another as we become one with the lord jesus christ who's already one with the father the end of the progression of faith till we come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, right? The finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do all things without disputings and murmurings that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, right? Walking in the gospel in a fear of the Lord that we bring forth the fruits of the expiatory death of the Lord Jesus Christ unto the stature of the fullness of Christ, the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with all every wind of doctrine, right? Because those crafty men were there waiting to deceive. Your adversary, the devil, is just looking to lead you astray and to have your heart once more. And if the Holy Spirit doesn't have your heart, well, then the devil has your heart. The, the world has your heart. The first man has your heart that we thenceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight by the slight of man and cunning craftiness whereby they wait, lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, right? Speaking the truth in love, in a fear of God, what the other person, the Holy Spirit's bringing these people forward, I just say these people, but people that we meet, is bringing people forward to use us as his vessels, as the strangers and pilgrims in the earth. And we speak, for me, I now speak every conversation I'm now having, I'm doing in an absolute fear of God, to be pleasing to God, serving God, absolutely fearing God, doing my utmost to do his commands, looking for every opportunity to bring forth the fruits of the expiatory death of the Lord Jesus Christ, that the righteousness of God be made in us and God will be glorified through the Lord Jesus Christ. Speaking the truth in love, right? This is not talking to people about conspiracies that don't want to hear it being led, speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. This ties into verse 16, from whom the whole body fitly fitly joined together and compacted. So this goes to the this goes to the outcome of the progression of faith, the seventh angel sounding. This is the end of all things. But for me here, all these scriptures are critical, but this here is absolutely crucial. This is absolutely critical. But speaking the truth in love may grow up, what's this, sorry, may grow up into him all things which is ahead of even Christ. So speaking the truth in love. So this now could be, okay, I love that person. So now I just have to tell them about what I know because I'm spreading the truth. That's what I used to do. That's why I'm speaking like this so very confidently because I used to do this. I used to run around trying to wake people up because that's that's what I thought the right thing was to do. It's one of many reasons why I'm very, very confident I'm not condemning or, or judging other people here because I was exactly the same. I know exactly from whence I came. I was doing exactly the same thing. And it's my testimony for the absolute, testimony is everything. It's our testimony 
is the Holy Ghost. But speaking the truth in love, the Lord Jesus Christ talks about this in Luke 10. To every, every conversation we have, we say to that person, peace, and we eat the meat that's before us. So that's what I say. I let people, for me, people have to come to me. It's my testimony. It might not be yours. But for me, people have to be drawn to me. And every time it happens, I have that conversation in the fear of God thinking, right, what's going on here? Listen to listen to what they say. And that's that, that for me is something absolutely epic that I've learned is more listening and less talking. And another big thing is by my own works, I, I do as much as I possibly can to completely remove the possibility that any of this is by my own hands. Because when you come out of a situation and you know it's been due to the Holy Spirit, my, 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 is that powerful. And because you've just received more testimony, the Holy Spirit, what better gift than that? The Holy Spirit has manifested himself again. So now the faith increases because the testimony is increased. And because the faith increases, you're going to have more testimony because you're going to be given more opportunities. The Holy, you're just going to see the Holy Spirit more and more and more. The cycle of life. From whom the whole body fitly framed together and compacted by that... And that, that's the other thing too. So but speaking the truth in love, I, I I talked about my friend Alex there before. Now it's coming up to 12 months since I met that man and the way it happened. For me, I, I'm just now growing more and more of the view that things need to be established by testimony. I'll come back to that in, in just a sec. But for me, the more we can establish by testimony, the more we know it's the Holy Spirit. So something happens to you how do you know? How can you establish? Can you establish by testimony how you know it was the Holy Ghost? So that's what I said before. If you think you can maybe run around trying to wake people up all the time, or how can you can you establish that by testimony? Can you establish that that's what the Holy Spirit has called you to do? He may have called you in due to him waking you up due to the evils of the world, but it's turned out for me that that's not why he wanted to use me. It turns out I absolutely detest reading. I absolutely detest studying texts. I can't stand it. I've never liked it. But this is what he's called me to do. It's just it's just bizarre, right? And it turns out that I absolutely love doing it. I absolutely love doing it. But if this is not what I thought I was going to be doing. And I can establish it by testimony. From September 2016, I can establish my whole story by testimony. And it's not because I'm great. This is the gospel. This is serving the heavenly kingdom. This is taking yourself out of the way. Establishing it all by testimony, a sequence of events. And now six and a half years later, here I am in this humble little abode doing this. And it's all by testimony. Now, this is the thing with Alex. He come up to me one day. And it turns out that he owns the takeaway food shop behind me, that the, the Chinese takeaway food. He just come up and said, g'day one day. So g'day, mate. And we just started talking. He says, what, 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 what do you do with yourself? And when people ask me that, it depends on who it is and what they're, what they're about and just, the, just the, the vibe of the conversation. But I, my go-to is what I said to him. I, I research. And he said, oh, what do you research? I said, I research the true nature of our reality. And he loved it. He loved it. And now, 12 months later, we've become best friends. I talk to, we talk regularly, regularly. I've never had a friend like this man. I've never had a, such a loyal friend as this man. Someone that I trust in the flesh. I've never, I've never had a friend like this man. Now, he started off talking about, talking about, I, I know I can talk about you, but I have, I have spoken about this before, if you, if I am blessed enough to have you watch. But he, he started out just, he, he, he wanted more and more and more and more and more and more and more about the conspiracies. And I, I never made it a work in my own hands. He come to me the whole time, the whole time, the whole time. He was reading scripture for a while, but then it all died off. For a few months there, it all, it all sort of died off and our relationship, our friendship sort of moved in a different direction. But at all times, I let him control the, 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 the conversation. I let him control the narrative. If he ever wants to come back and talk to script about scripture, which he does sometimes, he, he, yes, great, I'm here. And that's what it's all about. I know the Holy Spirit's using me to reach that man in some way, shape or form. His time, his time frame 
not my time frame, his time frame, because his time frame is the Lord's time frame, because I've got trust in the Lord. I've got faith in the Lord, and I'm just going to patiently wait. And now all of a sudden, because of what's happening on the earth right now, because clearly there's something amiss on the earth right now, and they, they're clearly amping up all of their agendas, because of that, he's now talking about he's now talking about the evils of the world more. So here we go. It's it, I've been waiting patiently for the Lord, and now here we here we go again. It's not about my own works, and I know it's all Holy Spirit led because I've just backed the gospel and had faith in the Holy Spirit at all times. And a big part of faith, I see a big work of faith, is patience. That patience for me is it's it's an absolute cornerstone of faith. Just patience. Just patiently waiting on the Lord. It is absolutely, it's absolutely faith. From whom the whole body fitly framed together, together. <laughs> dear, oh dear. Whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every, <laughs> every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part making increase of the body into the edification of itself in love. Now I've got to get on with this. It's now the next day. It's now the next day. It's now February. What is it? It's a Monday, February 13. And it is 2.30 in the afternoon here on the New South Wales Central Coast. I'm going to try and get this down half an hour and I'm already, I'm already eight minutes in. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk. In the, now get this, in the vanity of their mind, in the imagination of their own evil heart, de de declaring who they are in Christ, declaring their own purpose. Having the understanding darkened from being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. The first man. It's all Lucifer worship. It's all first man worship. Not submitting yourself to the righteousness of God. Not submitting yourself to testimony. Not submitting yourself to faith. Who being past feeling have given themselves over into... Now I'm going to let the very sophisticated man say this word. Lasciviousness. Is how you say it. La C V S. Now it's Greek word G7 double six. I cannot say this word. There's absolutely no chance of me trying to being able to say this word. None whatsoever. We see it the nine times, and we get it as that six times, and then we get wantonness, and then we get filthy. Now we get unbridled lust, excess, that one, and then that one, and wantonness and outrageousness, right? Shamelessness and insolence. Now, in the, in the Greek lexicon, we get character traits. It's pertaining to someone's character traits. The conduct and the character of one. Now, we get an earthly story with a heavenly meaning here of gluttony, right? Gluttony. So there are guts. They just want more and more and more food. They're, 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 very, they're becoming very, very fat in the imagination of their own heart. They're getting fat in planet Babylon. Fat on Lucifer. And then we get wanton acts or manners, right? And it's talking about it's talking about being outrageous, shamelessness, just no shame. Having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to that, to walk in all uncleanness, right? And greediness. Because it's all about them. You have not learned so learned in Christ. And if so, be that you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, right? Taught by him, taught by the Lord Jesus Christ by testimony. Now get this, that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, because he's the adversary. You saw that that video. I remember that day. I remember that day I went down to that park. That video I played there before from late 2018. Now, that was about three months before I gave up the wacky weed. And that was about four months before I gave up the grog, right? Now, I can establish both of those things, why I stopped doing those things by testimony. Now, because I was the Holy Spirit took them off me and they he took them off me for test, but by testimony, and it was I, I can establish by testimony, I would never ever in a month of Sundays now tell anybody else that they're sinning by having that or drinking. I wouldn't in a month of Sundays. I'm being led to think it's not great for you because putting smoke into your lungs, it's, it's not cool and you could hear it in my voice. I was developing a real smoker's cough. But that day, I, I, was, I was a bit strung out. 
I, I hadn't had it in a few days and I couldn't get it. And I was very, very frustrated and I was angry. I was angry at the world and I was angry at other people because they wouldn't think the way I thought. And I was angry because they wouldn't think the truth. I, I was angry at other people. Other people were getting to me. And to me, that was the old man. And that's the man, that's just the sample of that old man that I want annihilated. That, that old man that I want absolutely obliterated. So that's the thing. That's where I can establish this by testimony. It's not because I'm great. I establish it by testimony. You can't have this transformation that I've had. The, it, the, the, and the renewed, the renewed in the spirit of your mind, right? So putting off the corrupt, the old man, the corrupt man to the, to the deceitful lusts, right? So I thought I was doing the right thing. I thought back then it was my job to try and wake people up to the deceitful lusts and be renewed in the spirit of your mind that and you put on the new man. That's what all of this is about. That's what all of this is about is obliterating Lucifer and coming alive in the Lord Jesus Christ. You saw what I was like. I was a horror. You get me angry back then, boy, boy, oh boy. You, you talk about on the road, being full of rage on the road. My goodness gracious me, if you ever tailgated me, I used to slam on the brakes. You used, to, you used to slam on the brakes. And you put off the, and the way the Holy Spirit has refined me by tailgaters, it is not funny. Establishing it all by testimony. That's what all of this is about. And the less you make it about yourself, and the more you take yourself out of the way, the more you know and are absolutely certain it's by testimony. And it's because it's the Holy Spirit. And you get to know him more and more and more. And that's a part of my testimony. I started this, I started doing videos on YouTube because the sequence of events led me to do it. And it's a diary. I started I started off doing this as a diary. And I look back now at those videos and it's just, a, it's a diary. And it's all by testimony. None of it's by my own works. I've got to go out and execute the works. But I do it all by testimony. I do it all by the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Just establishing it by testimony. To me, it's absolutely critical in all this. That you put on the new man, after which God is created in righteousness and true holiness. I feel like I'm really rushing here. Wherefore, put away lying and speak every man's right. So this is critical. Don't lie. Most significantly, don't lie to yourself. Speaking every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Uh, this one still baffles me. Be ye angry and sin not, right? Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. So be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Now, to me, that's a that's a that's a big sin to be angry, right? But it's a different Greek word. But I've got to start on track. I might come back to this in part two of this video, right? So neither give place to the devil. So what's that? It's let yourself down. It's letting that old man take over. It's letting Lucifer loose in your in, in in your getting angry again because people won't listen to the flat earth sitting there doing conspiracy videos and just getting crazy that people won't listen and getting absolutely insane with rage that people won't listen and why won't they wake up that's that's the old man that's the old man taking over that's the big tempter that's the big tempter. Lucifer and the devil just work hand in hand with one another. Now get this one in verse 29. So verse 28, let him that stole no more, but rather let him labor, I'm, I'm rushing, working with his hands, the thing which is good, that he might have give to him that needeth. Now get this, let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth, right? That's what I did in that car video earlier. That was corrupt communication. That was not going to edify anybody and that was not going to administer grace to the hearers. Verse 29, Ephesians 4, 29, this is how we wake other people up. Let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, building one another, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. So by our very deeds, our very works, that can administer grace to the hearers. That's how we wake people up. The Holy Spirit wakes people up, not us. It's all about the Holy Spirit. It's, it's, it's serving the kingdom above. We are tilling Babylon. I think about Zerubbabel now. Zerubbabel means sown in Babylon. That's what we're doing. We're sowing in Babylon, but we're going to reap 
in Jerusalem because we're we're sowing. It's it's hard, right? Because we're sowing physically in Babylon, but spiritually in Babylon, we're sowing Zion, and we're going to reap in Jerusalem. And Jerusalem, that's the that's the body of Christ. The new. I, I wonder if this now we whether this. The Hebrews it was a, the captain of our salvation, perfect. Our new man is actually the Lord Jesus Christ. But that's the I got same track, right? That's the whole body being being joined together and compacted. That's the outcome of the progression of faith. That's the building. That's the building of the church. It's the obliteration of that old man. That's how we wake other people up. That's how we wake other people up by, by our very deeds, not being not being this word, not doing this, not doing this, not walking after the imagination of our own heart. No, it's just about being it's about being patient, but patiently waiting and trusting the gospel. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Now I even see this. This causes strife and it causes contention. Who's sealed? Can you lose your salvation? All of these vain questions. Just trust the Holy Spirit and walk in the gospel and just know that we're not serving this world. We're serving the, 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 the world to come. We're serving the, the heavenly kingdom. And he's got our heart. He's got our focus. He's got our attention. And he's got our fear. And thus we don't we don't fear the carnal. We don't fear the flesh. Because the, 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 all of these devils... They're subject to the Lord Jesus Christ. So why would you fear them? Let all bitterness, right? Now, these are character traits of the first man. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger. So that's why I find verse 26 so perplexing. Be ye angry, let not the sun go down upon your wrath, but wrath and anger clearly are a sin. But it's a different Greek word for memory. And clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. But be kind one to another, tender hearted, now forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has given. Oh, look at that, for Christ's sake. Right there it is there. There it is there. So what's what's the sake of Christ? Well, for he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We're bringing forth the fruits of the expiatory death of the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ by walking in the gospel, bringing forth the fruits. We're attributing that sacrifice. Okay, what's the purpose? Why has he done it? Oh, just so we can sit around and just argue about doctrine, right? And just one save, all I save. No, now it's going on. Now it's started. Forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. So why has God forgiven us for Christ's sake? It's so that we can bring forth the fruits of the Lord Jesus Christ's expiatory death. The whole thing is about justifying to people. God doesn't need to be justified. I can't think of the right word if it's the wrong word, but that's what it's all about. It's that word appropriating. I can't think of the word I... All these long words, right? But it's it's appropriating. I think it is the right word. It's appropriating that that sacrifice that the Lord Jesus Christ made. That's why God has forgiven us for Christ's sake. So we do it to one another, right? This we're getting translated back into the image of God as the first man gets obliterated, right? Now these are all character traits of that first man. Now when you come back to this Bible verse of the day. That's what Satan wants us to do. Satan wants us to behave like this. Bitterness, wrath, anger, right? So when you think about these conspiracies and all these agendas that are going on in the earth, how do they make you feel? And how do you speak when you talk about them? Why do they do these things? And why is there such a revelation going on right now of all this truth? It's a false awakening now at the moment, right? But why? Why are they doing it? Now, I want to share these, these scriptures next video. I'll just touch on them now. So I call this the Galatians 5 purge. Now, these are all the works of the, well, these are works of the first man, right? So we've got adultery, fornication, uncleanness, and this word again. So the fornication is, for me, an uncleanness. It's committing adultery with the world. It's turning it back on the heavenly kingdom, the Lord Jesus Christ, the kingdom we should be serving. And it's now serving the world and giving yourself over to these character traits. Thus, 
all of those, if you exhibit, if you, if you exhibit those character traits still, well, you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God if that's how you still are at the end of all this. If you still are, I mean, so long as you're, so long as you're on the right path, and to, to me, we're all going to start somewhere, right? Just because you're doing these things still, it doesn't mean that you're not going, but, but no. If that's how you are at the end, these are character traits that are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. So you can justify yourself as much as you want. You can make fun of people that, 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 that love the gospel and it's all about peace, love and truth. You can make fun. You can justify all you like. But if you're still angry, no matter what, if you're angry at anything, anything, and you're still and you're still focused on the world and conspiracy theorists and trying to trying to wake people up and, and all the rest of it. If that's still your focus, well the world is still your focus and you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. And that's what the Lord Jesus Christ for me is talking about in John 8. The, their father is the devil. Now they if they were the sons of Abraham, they'd do the works of Abraham. What's Abraham? Abraham's the father of faith. Abraham's seed in the in the house, in the in the house of God, his seed is the seed of faith. So they're children of the world. They're still the first man. They're still Lucifer. Now the Lord Jesus Christ talks about this in Mark 7. So I've labeled it the seed of Satan are manifest by works, making the sons of Satan, right? The sons of Satan, as I just grow more and more, I see it over and over again that Lucifer seems to be the son of Satan. Don't know what, how this goes. I don't know how this goes. It has got something to do with the serpent seducing, I'm not saying for one minute that the Lord, the Lord created the son of Satan. I'm not saying that, but he became the son of Satan, right? Yeah. Lucifer became the son of Satan, the first man due to sin. And it was his father, the devil, that tempted him. So he turned his back on, oh man, 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 man. I've got to stay on track, right? But the Lord Jesus Christ, for, for within, out of the heart of men, right? So who owns your heart? This is a war for our soul that's playing out in our mind that's determined by who owns our heart. So from within, out of the heart of men, proceed these things, right? This is the first man. This is all of the, this is, these are the character traits that Paul's warning against in Galatians 5. These character traits will not inherit the kingdom of God and they come out of the heart. And if you haven't got the Holy Spirit dwelling within you, you're still tilling the land, your heart, the seed, with the seed of Satan, the first man. You haven't, you haven't given yourself over. That's the thing. That's the cold, hard reality of all this. It's not a cold, hard reality, but it is in terms of that's the reality. Is if these are you, these character traits will not inherit the kingdom of God. So if you've still got some of these character traits, there's something amiss. There's something to miss. It's about us getting ourselves sorted and there's no righteousness in being awake to the evils of the world and there's no righteousness in trying to wake other people up by the works of your own hands and there's no righteousness, there's no salvation in what you perceive as the iniquities of others. It's about you and for me, it's about me. And then, then where other people come in, is it's about us walking in the gospel. This is where other people come in. We walk in the gospel. We're being translated, the renewing of our mind as we put on the new man. Thus, thus by walking in the gospel, this is how we bring people to the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is these are, these are, these are the corrupt communications, right? I want to talk about this more on the next video. Where am I? Keep going. I can, I can still do this. So then you come back to this Bible verse of the day, and that's what Satan is doing. He's hell-bent. He wants us to slip back into these character traits. Now, this one here, 2 Timothy 2.22, my goodness, all the, all the twos, right? Flee also youthful lusts, right? So the world wants us to think this is a lecture about our sex life. Now, that was a youthful lust of mine. I used to react. It used to incense me when people wouldn't talk about the flat earth, or wouldn't admit to the flat earth. It used to incense me when people would say that that pride is just about rainbow gay flag marching, right? Now, how do I know? I know this by testimony because I was created thus. I know this by testimony. And I'm like, I'm living, breathing proof of all this and no one wants to hear, right? It used to do my head in and it used to absolutely make me crazy, right? 
they were my useful lusts. I was still exhibiting the, the, the character traits of that first man, just like in that video. I wasn't there yet. I was still on. I was still. I'd still. I'm not saying I am now, but for me, anger is is a big deal for me, and it's something that's that's evaporating from my from my temple, from my land, by the very very moment. But a youthful lust of mine was to react, and that Satan. That's what he wants us to do. That's his number one goal. He wants us to react, and he wants out of our heart to proceed. That's what he wants. Satan is hell-bent on our heart. That's what he's doing here. He wants us to go back to the first man, Lucifer. He wants us to go back. His son, right? I'm starting to see it more and more. He wants us to go back to these youthful lusts that were outside the gospel because they're not going to inherit the kingdom of God and follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. The testimony, the testimony of our conscience. It's absolutely, it's absolutely huge. I've got a couple of things noted down here, but I'm coming up to, I'll just have a look. We need to establish by tech. Yeah, I've said that. Yeah, I think I've pretty well, I've pretty well touched on these. We're visitors from heaven speaking the, the heavenly things, not the earthly. Oh, yes, 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 yes. So our number one purpose is our own salvation. So that's the beam and the moat. And there is a scripture, I forgot about this. There's a scripture, I think, in, in Philippians 1 that talks about abounding in love more and more, but it also talks about more in knowledge and all judgment. So that word judgment, it's huge because that's what this is all about. We need to make judgment on certain situations. We need to try the spirits. We have to judge situations. We're not judging the person. The Lord Jesus Christ is the judge. But we judge a situation so we can make a good decision, so that we can have good judgment. It's heavenly judgment that we're given. It's not about judging others. It's about judging the situation. And a part of that is doctrine. And it's a big part of my testimony that I put down as a pupil, as a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, as that pupil, it's my it's my testimony that I put down here what I'm learning. And I can't revile from the truth. I'm not judging anybody. I'm not condemning anybody. But I know in my heart that there's going to be at least one person in after I do this video who's going to get something from this, right? Now, that's not going to help my salvation per se because my salvation is all just about the progression of faith and me becoming a better man, but I'm executing my office. Well done, my good and faithful servant, right? I'm doing what's required, my testimony, what the Holy Spirit's learned, taught me about my office, right? And it is, I'm, I'm, I'm rushing. But for me, it's, that's, that's what, it's not condemning others. It's not judging other people. It's judging the situation. And a big part of judging the situation is judging doctrines, judging whether something's good, false or, or true. And that's what we get in Hebrews 5. Those that are off the milk and a full age, they actually receive the knowledge of good and evil. As we go on and on, we receive more of that knowledge of good and evil. We know what's, we know what's true and we know what's not true. And truth is just the cornerstone, tr 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 the cornerstone of my faith. Truth is my anchor. Ever since I learned and reconciled that moon landing was a hoax, truth became my anchor from that day. So our, my, my, my number one purpose is my own salvation, right? My own salvation. And then you can help your brother pull the beam from out of the moat from out of his eye, right? Now, I don't pray, pray to be saved from the wrath. I don't. I don't pray to be saved from the wrath. I pray that I will be translated. Thus, I will be in that fit state being translated back into the image of God when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. That's what I pray for. I pray for the translation. I pray for the outcome of the progression of faith, the renewing of my mind, day in, day out, day in, day out. Now, I didn't mention the word grace. I've hardly used the word grace right through this video, but for me, this is what this is what the resurrection is. The resurrection is grace. The expeciary death of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're being called to, according to his purpose so that we can bring fruit, forth the fruits of 
the expiatory death of the Lord Jesus Christ. By being sanctified, that's, that's the grace. That's why we're under grace. And it's by faith so that it can be by grace. And grace, grace is the resurrection. Didn't, don't think I knew that before I did this video. Amazing, right? Amazing. Now, this. I thought about this just earlier, just earlier this morning, actually. I thought about this. How many times do you, and not judging, again, it's just an observation, but how many times, particularly on YouTube, do you see people talking about the Lord Jesus Christ as a result of talking about the evils of the world? How often do you hear people talk about the evils of the world due to them talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. That for me is a big deal. You hardly see it. You hardly see it. And for me, that's 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 key to all this, is that because of because we're we're serving the heavenly kingdom by faith and by thus by, by testimony, then due to that testimony, due to the scriptures, due to our translation, we can then observe the world. And then see the evils of the world that for me is a big deal i see over and over again it's just rife right now that people only talk about jesus because they talk about the world but people aren't talking about the world because they're talking about jesus to me that's an absolute big deal now what i am going to do now is just share a couple of news articles very very quickly and this is where i'm going to pick up on part two of this right so when i show you these news articles I'm just going to touch on them quickly now. I ask you, what thinketh you? How do you feel? What's your heart telling you? How do you feel when you see these stories? And when you talk about these stories to other people, what are your, how's your speech? What sort of speech are you using? Just questions, not judgment, not condemnation, right? Because for me, this is a manifestation of Satan walking about seeking whom he may devour, right? Trying to get us outside the gospel. So this story here, Brooklyn Nets, some sort of sport in America, right? So Brooklyn's Nets star Cam Thomas fined $40,000 over no homo comment, and that's a derogatory phrase. How does that make you feel? When you see a story like this, some creature at some backslapping awards night getting dressed up as Satan, and it was sponsored. It was sponsored by you know who, right? Now, particularly when we know that you know who the CEO is this, right? So then, how does that make you feel? How does that make you feel? Is Satan having his way with you, right? This is where I want to pick it up next video. I'm not saying we just become dead to all this stuff, but how's it making you feel? How's it making you feel, right? Is Satan succeeding? And then this one, I'll turn this bloke off. I used to love this guy back in the day. He's a right winger, but I just see him for what he is now, right? Due to testimony. Severely damaged and abandoned. Now, I don't even know on YouTube whether I can even say this headline yet. I don't know. When I say yet, I'm but I'm of the view because I've had I've recently had some some strikes removed that still make no sense to me. I've had them removed. And I, I, I'm starting to think that we can just start talking more openly. And Alex said something about that the other day, but I've got to stay on track because I'm pretty well coming up to three hours, I would have thought. So severely damaged and abandoned. Australian victims of the purple dragon demon juice injuries feel, right? Now, this doesn't happen. This isn't real. This is a crazy conspiracy theorist. This is demon juice denial. This is crazy talk, right? But this is Sky News. This is one of the big news networks here in Australia. So we've got victims of this thing now. We've got all of this truth coming out, right? They feel they're not being heard by the Australian government. So how does that make you feel? Because 12 months ago, as I say, this isn't true. This is a conspiracy theory. You're a right-wing nut job. You're a right-wing conspiracy theorist who needs to be shut down. And your, and your video needs to be struck. So now that they're doing this, how does this make you feel? Now I'm gonna finish up on this one. When you see this, how does this make you feel? This is where I'm gonna pick up on the next video, but I'm gonna end this video right now by playing this new story. And again, I ask thee, what thinketh ye when I 
play this story. How does this make you feel? There was no shortage of colour and skin as Melbourne's annual Midsummer March made its triumphant return. Young and old put on their dancing shoes and dazzled tens of thousands who lined the streets of St Kilda. Revving their engines to a roaring crowd. They were loud and proud and painted St Kilda all colours of the rainbow. Uh, today's just about making sure that everyone can celebrate who they are and feel supported and feel loved just for being themselves. It's wonderful. It's absolutely fabulous. I feel there's hope that people will be more generous, kinder, better. Melbourne's annual Midsummer March saw Fitzroy Street turn dance floor. <laughs> The march led by Premier Daniel Andrews. In Victoria, equality is not negotiable, that every single Victorian should feel uh, respected, valued and most importantly, they should feel safe. Some rolled their way while others chose a different method. They sauntered and sashayed with flair to the delight of the 50,000 strong crowd, the biggest number the parade has ever seen. Celebrating diversity, youngsters led the charge. You're here today to see the difference that this makes advocating for our kids. They're our most, they need us the most. With emergency services showing their support. There's over 100 police here today. We've got our Pride Network representatives here. It's just a fantastic day. We want to represent this community. We want them to know we care. The march is the signature event, but the celebration doesn't stop there. It will continue at venues across the city well into the night. And next weekend is Victoria's Pride Street Party. The message of love and inclusion, loud and clear. Everyone allowed to be themselves and express themselves in, you know, whichever way that they want. And that's what's so great about events like this. Today is about pride, it's about inclusivity, it's about being part of a great community. When I was a younger man, I hadn't a care. Fooling around, hitting the town, growing my hair. You came along and stole my heart when you entered my life. What it takes, so I made you my wife. Since then, I never.